radiology. I mean, this is the radiology class, definitely. Um, well, it's just still start. Yeah. So we're going to talk about radiology in this class. Um, and well, radiology is very important for us. Like taking x-rays is an important part of our job as dental assistants. And it's an important and tool that we use in dentistry. It's very helpful for us, right? Um, definitely the practical part that you're going to learn in the lab would be very important for you to be able to achieve and do, which you're going to do with Dr. Espina. Um, and that is the most important part that we're going to do, you know, no, knowing how to actually take the x-ray, uh, how to put the things inside a patient mouth, what is the correct, what are the correct angles that we are using, um, what are the types of film, which type of x-ray we take for which type of procedure, these kind of things. In our lecture, we're trying to learn the things behind it, the science behind the, the, the radiology. It might not be as exciting, but you have to think about you're technically a, a college student, you know, you're and you need to learn a little bit more further than any regular dental assistant out there. And I think one of the things that you need to be proud of and aware of, you know, in HCC, we're the only program, which most probably, you know, what is the program that is a one year program. Um, and we all program that is as, uh, approved by the COVID which is the uh, Commission on Dental Education, which means our program go through uh, a very tight part, uh, things of requirements that we have to do. And our students, when they graduate from our program, they have a different level of, of education than any regular dental assistant. You know, there are other dental assisting schools, I'm not saying they're bad, but they're, you know, they have a much shorter class time. They will graduate their students. They will go and be dental assistant, but not like you guys. You're here in a college and in a program that is, again, the only program in Houston that have um, that is a one-year program. So sometimes you might feel that, well, I don't need all of this information, right? I mean, yeah, I'm going to go out and work with patients. I'm not going to use any of the information here. But again, keep that also in the back of your mind that you're here, you know, in a different type of class. You're not just, you know, being a regular dental assistant. You're getting a little bit more advanced education. So hopefully you will use this uh, this opportunity. You know, you're already here. You got accepted. So try to enjoy learning these subjects that we're talking about, although they might feel a little bit away from the practical, you know, things that we do out there. But again, you invest, you're investing your time. Uh, and you're getting a good degree for it, you know. One of the things that we'll talk about later, you know, that you guys can apply uh, for a CDA exam to be certified dental assistant right after school, actually three years before, uh, not three months <laughs> before you finish your course, which no other school would offer you, you know. Other dental assistant needs to work for two years before they can sit for a CDA exam. A CDA dental assistant is a higher level than an RDA dental assistant. An RDA is registered with the state of Texas. A CDA is certified, which means technically can work in about 48 states. Uh, a CDA can work with dental schools, can work with the army. So there are other things to it. Again, that is just because you're in this program. So it gives you that opportunity other than other things. So again, that, <laughs> that all uh, to say that Things that we're learning here are a little bit more in depth about the things uh, that you do in the clinic, because again, it's a different program. It's a little bit higher level program. Okay, so why do you think, guys, before we go into the history of, of radiology, why do you think we take x-rays in the first place? What is the reason of x-rays? To see inside of the teeth, right? So in a way, I mean, when we look, or not just the teeth, what else? bone right exactly the jaws so looking at the teeth by by our eyes only, and also by even using some of our instruments to see is not enough right 
because sometimes cavities happen between the teeth or we cannot reach freely. We cannot see, we cannot feel. Uh, problems can happen under the gum. Where we, again, we cannot reach, we cannot see. Or under the bone where we have an infection and a person can have maybe um, a periapical abscess. All of these things we will not be able to access without having radiology. So x-ray is a very important tool in our diagnostic box that we use in dentistry. And it's one of the first steps that will help us really to identify and uh, zone in the actual problem. It has a little bit of shortcoming because it's a 2D image at the end of the day. But again, it gives us a lot of information. So the whole idea of today's uh, technically um, lecture is to get a little bit more into depth on how the x-ray actually is formed. What is that What is that thing that we call an x-ray? I mean, an x-ray, when you, how many of you have taken x-ray on, you know, that you went to the dentist and they took x-ray on you? Right, almost all, right? You have to, most probably you took an, you take an x-ray some, you know, time in your life. So x-ray is not visible, right? You didn't see an x-ray coming. Did it hurt? No, it didn't hurt, right? So it's a weird type of thing. It's a radiation, right? It doesn't have a, a look. You cannot see it. It doesn't have a smell, right? It doesn't hurt per se. Uh, so it is a weird thing, technically. And that's why actually they call it an x-ray because the person that first invented it didn't know what ray it is, what type of radiation it is. So he called it an x-ray. You know, that means it's an unknown uh, radiation. So that's what we're trying to figure out. What is the, what is that radiation and how do we actually make it in our uh, machines? Okay, on, on our x-ray machine. When we hit the button on the x-ray machine, what happens exactly inside of the machine? And not just inside of the machine, you know, from just a, a simple view, but even to the atom level, like what happens to the materials and how can we actually produce that type of, of radiation, okay? So um, I think uh, I will start with a video first. So I need to switch gears here a little bit. And um, the videos that I'm going to share are all in your uh, Canvas. So if you are on the exam one, uh, you don't need to go there. I'm just showing you exam one resources. You will find we have additional resources and this is the video that I'm going to play. And we have some other videos in there uh, that are uh, nice and helpful. Um, I'm not going to record it in here. Um, it will play in the background. Most probably you'll hear it in the background, but uh, let's go ahead and see how do x-ray works to at least give us a good idea about what are x-rays what x-rays are at some point in your life but did you know this life-saving technology was actually invented by accident german physicist wilhelm Röntgen discovered the technology while he was doing experiments with electron beams in gas discharge tubes you know like everyone does when performing these tests, he noticed that a fluorescent screen in his lab started to glow green while electron beams were running. This wasn't surprising in its own right, but Ronchen's screen was shielded by heavy cardboard, which he thought would block the radiation. The interesting part of the discovery was that the initial aspect of Ronchen's discovery was simply the existence of some kind of penetrating radiation. But in trying to figure out what was happening, he actually put his hand in between the screen and the electron beam. This created an image of the bones inside his hands on the screen, revealing... So technically, he made a device, as you can hear, you know, uh, that have some kind of energy in it, and he have a, a fluorescent screen on the other side, and he just noticed that it's, it's glowing, and that's how actually he discovered X-ray. And he put his hand in there, right? And it, it shows, <laughs> right? And now definitely going to talk about the bad things about radiology, which is the radiation and how it can cause cancers. But that's how it was first discovered. Perfect use of after their discovery. This double discovery marked arguably one of the most important medical advances in all of human history. It gave professionals the ability to see ailments in 
inside of the human body without invasive surgery. It even allowed them to see soft tissues with slight modification. No one questions that x-rays are important to modern medicine, but most people don't have a great idea of what is actually happening when you get one. You can think of x-rays as light rays. Both are electromagnetic energy carried in weight by photons. The major difference between these types of rays is the energy level or wavelength of the rays. So technically, this is the spectrum. And uh, x-rays just have more energy than other, uh, you know, photons that we can see. Sometimes like even the visible light or the microwave. It's all x-rays. It's all uh, electromagnetic radiation. They're all in the same spectrum. But the x-ray is just a high level, a high energy of that spectrum. Okay. but shorter and longer wavelengths fall outside of our visible spectrum. X-rays are shorter, higher energy waves, and radio waves are longer, lower energy waves. X-rays are produced by the movement of electrons between the atoms. So now we're getting a little bit deeper into like what actually happened to the atom of the material, which we're going to explain a little bit more, but again, this video kind of just shows you some general things that we can... So, you know, an atom is the the kind of building block of anything, of all of our materials. That, that is one of the smallest. I mean, there are even smaller parts, but one of the smallest, the smallest thing of materials are an atom, right? That one atom. An atom has electrons that are running, you know, around it. And technically what we do, we hit uh, an electron to these, on, on these electrons as well. And by hitting them, we're going to make x-ray, in a way, in a, in a simple way to say it. In this case, the energy of the photon has to match the energy difference between the two electrons. If this doesn't occur, then the photon can't cause a shift between orbitals. This functionality means that as photons from x-rays pass through your body, each tissue's atoms absorb or react to photons differently. The soft tissues in your body are composed of smaller atoms. So they don't absorb x-rays well due to the photon's high energy. On the other hand, the calcium atoms of bones are much larger, so they do absorb the x-ray photons and thus result in a different view on the x-ray image. Inside of x-ray machines, there's an electrode pair, an anode and a cathode. Okay, so we're getting to the interesting stuff. This is the x-ray tube head, the, the big thing that, you know, they would hold to to actually take the x-ray with that they put really close to your to your face you know they're trying to take an x-ray and it has as you know you hear you heard we have two pairs you have a cathode and you have an anode in it inside of a vacuum tube usually in glass the cathode is usually a heated filament and the anode is a flat disc made of tungsten as the cathode is heated up electrons spurt out of the filament and find their way to the anode the voltage difference between the anode and the cathode is very high, which allows the electrons to travel through the air with a high velocity. So technically, just thinking about electricity, right? With electricity, we have a negative and positive in a way. So we connected the negative here to the cathode, and then we connected the positive technically to the anode. And because it's a very high voltage in between them, we'll have some electrons running from the cathode and hitting the anode really, really quick and really, really fast and really, really hard. When they hit the anode atoms, then that's how the X-ray will start forming because it will push the electrons that we just looked at and will make a difference in the kinetic energy. And that, you know, once these electrons that are hitting from the cathode, hitting the anode, once they are stopping, there's a lot of energy that are lost and this energy that is lost will be coming an X-ray radiation. Again, we're going to go through this a little bit. Through the tube at such a high pace and hit the tungsten atoms of the anode 
It knocks loose electrons in the lower orbitals of the atoms. As electrons fall from higher orbitals to these lower energy levels, the extra energy is released as a photon. Since this rock is large, it releases high energy photons, or an X-ray. This is how normal X-rays are produced and function. But in cases where soft tissue, like human organs, need to be examined, then contrast media needs to be added. Contrast media are typically liquids that absorb X-rays and collect in soft tissues. To examine blood vessels, doctors will inject this media into veins. Oftentimes, in these cases of soft tissue viewing, doctors will also use fluoroscopes to see the image in real time and can even capture videos using these devices. To collect the actual image from an x-ray, doctors use a film or sensor on the other side of the patient. These films work nearly identically to normal photographic film, and the sensors are particularly sensitive to x-rays. Through all of this imaging, doctors can deduce a wide array of important medical data from x-rays. Even with the significance of x-rays, they can still be dangerous in high doses, as they are a form of ionizing radiation. This means that when an x-ray hits an atom, it can actually knock electrons off to form an ion, or an electrically charged atom. The free electrons then collide with other atoms to create even more ions. Ions can cause unnatural chemical reactions within the body, resulting in mutations in a patient's DNA. This mutation can then become cancerous or form other issues. It's this reason that doctors try to sparingly use x-rays, or at least use them only when absolutely necessary. In low doses and infrequently, x-rays are nothing to be afraid of and can be a life-saving medical technology in the modern era. Okay. So let's go back to our slides and see what we have. Okay, so I'm going to move a little bit beyond the historic things because we can go back to these. Um, and let's start with this. So first, to actually be able to start understanding things and uh, relating to things that we talk about, we need to know the parts of an x-ray machine. What is an x-ray machine actually uh, made of? So uh, we have a one group that been in the x-ray uh, lab. So most probably you guys are going to answer motor, most of these uh, uh, questions here. So A is this part. Let's see. A is this part here. You know what we call that? You guys that were in the lab? No? Huh? Uh, yeah, that exactly the place that you just the setting, we call it a control panel. Right? That is the control panel. So this is the place where we adjust the setting. So do you think we give the same radiation to an adult as for a kid? No. So we need a place that we need to adjust the the energy, the the energy of the radiology of the X-ray that we give, and that place is the control panel. Okay. B is. Huh? Yeah, the arm, right? <laughs> it is the extension arm. So. B is the extension arm. I mean, we have to name it something, huh? <laughs> C is this thing here. That is the... The what? The tube head. That is the tube head, okay? This is where magic happens. This is where the X-ray actually form. This is where the athode, the athode, the anode, and the cathode is located at. Okay, this is what we were looking at. This is where uh, the energy and the electrons form. All of these things. Okay, and the last one, which is D, I gave you a name for it, which is a cone, right? But it's also called a PID. 
And PID stands for position I is indicating and D is device. <laughs> So now on, from now on, when you go to the lab and Dr. Espina asks you about these, you're going to tell him, yeah, we learned this already, right? At least start knowing these, uh, the names of these things, the, the parts of the, of the x-ray uh, unit. Okay. Since we're here, let's just talk a little bit about the safety. Definitely you want to uh, protect the the, the radiosensitive organs with a lead apron, which is this thing here. That's a lead, lead apron. That This is the guy, you know, wearing the lead apron. Anyway, um, the safe distance for uh, x-ray is what? How, what is your safe distance to an x-ray, to an active x-ray running? You know, when you click it, how many feet you have to be away from it? Just give me a number. Huh? 20? Six? Outside? Three? Yeah, six. Six is the minimum. Six feet, that is your safety, um, your, the safe distance from an x-ray. When you expose uh, the x-ray, you do not want to hold the film inside the patient mouth, definitely. That's why we have film holders. And you do not want to stabilize the tube head because sometimes, you know, these tube heads would not be stable. You know, they will go down as you take the x-ray or something like that. Definitely, you don't want to be in the room when you expose the patient. That's that's the whole idea. And then you want to follow ALARA concept. And I don't think anyone will be able to, to tell me what ALARA stands for. But technically, it's as low as reasonably achievable, which means... When you are taking an x-ray for a child, you want to reduce the x-ray as much as possible, just enough to get a good x-ray for a child. When you're taking an x-ray for an anterior teeth, it's not the same energy when you're taking an x-ray for a posterior tooth, right? So you want to reduce the x-ray and make it as low exposure as possible. You always to have keep that in mind for the patient safety and, okay? That is the LR concept, as low as reasonably achievable. So this is just like general few rules about, about radiology safety. Okay. Moving on. What do we call? Oh. Yeah. As low as reasonably achievable. All good? Yes. Okay, what did we call the whole thing here? Huh? The tube head, right? The tube head. The tube head, this thing is this thing here. C, number C is what we're looking at here, right? Again, we are just trying to figure out now how x-ray is formed, right? We need to understand what's going on inside of this tube head when we press the button. So remember, we said we have what two parts of it. We have an anode, which is what is the charge for the anode? Positive. positive. And we have a cathode that is negative. If you want to remember anode is positive, you always want to get an A plus, not a C minus, right? I saw that on a video. <laughs> so, but yeah, it is a great way because I keep forgetting. I always think like an anode with an O, there is a plus on it or something. Anyway, A plus, C minus, right? So anode is positive, cathode is negative. Inside of this cathode, you can see there is a small filament, this thing here, this filament. So technically think of it as type of light bulbs, right? Where you have a filament that will light up. I mean, there are some light bulbs like, like that now. Uh, so, and more, most of them for decorative reasons so this would heat up this element will heat up this filament i'm sorry not element would heat up let me just make my font smaller maybe a different color yeah so this filament would heat up because of the energy 
And because it heats up too much, we will have some electrons in here running, you know. You can see we have this kind of uh, concave shape thing. This will just, you know, uh, consolidate them and make sure that they're all focused on one area. What will happen is these electrons will travel fast and hit what? The anode, right? When they hit the anode, the particles, these electrons will hit some atoms, okay? These atoms will stop these electrons, and because they stop them, the extra energy that is left, because it's stopped, and energy, you know, we, we energy cannot be, uh, what is that law? You know, you cannot create energy and you cannot... And it's something like that, exactly, right? So because they stop these electrons, we have an extra energy. This energy would appear as a X-ray. That is the simple way to put it. So I encourage you to be able to explain X-ray to someone. You know, when you go home after the lecture or something, I want you to be able to explain X-ray, like how X-ray is produced in the most simple way uh, to someone else. So technically, you have two parts, uh, a negative and a positive, right? Uh, a cathode and anode. Uh, one part would heat up too much and will create some electrons. These electrons will go and hit the anode. And because of the energy that it will be released, that is the, technically the X-ray that we use for our, uh, you know, purposes to take radiology. There are other parts in here, but um, I think we're going to talk about these a little bit more. Technically, all of this is uh, insulated by oil because there is a lot of heat that happened around uh, making the x-rays, as we will talk about in a little bit. And then we have a window where the x-rays will come from, out from. And guess what this thing is that doesn't have a label? A cone, right? That is exactly right. That is the cone. That is the cone, and we call it also what? Exactly. PID or position indicating device. Awesome. So now let's start looking into um, what happened in an atom level. We know it now from outside, kind of general view. This is what happened. There are electrons that go and hit something, and then X-ray would happen. Now let's just go a little bit more in depth and get to know what happens in an atom. So these are some terms. Uh, matter is anything that occupies space. Uh, everything is technically matter. Energy, that is ability to work and heat, and all of these things are energy. Blank is the smallest, the smallest particle of substance, and blank is the smallest particle of an element. Okay, atom or m molecule? A molecule is the smallest part of, uh, particle of a substance, and an atom is the smallest particle of an element. Technically, if more than one atom get together, it will make what? A molecule, right? So an atom is smaller than a molecule. So if you see here, this is a water molecule which we all know H2O, right? So that means it has two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom, and that's why we have a molecule there, right? While regular atom, like oxygen here, is just by itself. If we dig deep a little bit more into what each atom is made of, do you guys know what an atom made of? Huh? Exactly, right? So uh, electrons, neutrons, and protons. So this is an atom. And as you can see, kind of it looks like the solar system in a way, right? So for our solar system, the sun is the center, right? And then you have things that go around the sun, which are the planets. So in an atom, the center is called what? Nucleus, right? This is the nucleus. That is the center of the atom. I'll put too many lines in there. 
inside of the nucleus, we have two things. One thing is the protons, which is positively charged, right? We have just a particle that called proton, which is positively charged. As you can see, it has the pluses on it. And we have another part that we call neutron, which is no charge, okay? Again, this is just what the atom is made of. That's, that's, how, that's how it is, okay? And around each atom, we have orbital spaces. And in these orbital spaces, we have what? The electrons, right? So again, each atom is made of electrons, which are negatively charged, and it's made of a nucleus that have protons that are positively charged and neutrons that doesn't have any charge, okay? That's the general structure of any atom. These orbits that you see, these you see here, we have a K orbit and an L orbit. Um, the more that you get closer to the nucleus, the more energy you have in an orbit, technically. Just get that, you know, just uh, know that in general. So again, see protons here, neutrons, and electrons. Okay, so let's fill in the blank. The first one is electrons, right? So it's negatively charged. They're stable in their orbit. Uh, unless they are disturbed. And then you have protons that are positively charged and they are in the nucleus and determine the atomic number because each atom has an atomic number and it is determined by the number of protons that it has. And then the last one, neutrons that has no charge and it's also found in the nucleus. Okay, and again, this is just another picture here uh, for that. I moved a little bit more here to talk about extra, you know, production since we're we talked about it here, and I think this picture would show us uh, a good representation of it. So you can see in here, in this picture, we have a C and A and B. And technically, these are coming from where? The cathode or the anode? The cathode, right? These things are actually came, coming from the cathode. Right in here, we did see that. Right, this is the cathode, and it, it runs its electrons and send them to the anode. So inside of the anode, we have an atom, right? Just like any other material. And we have these hitting the electrons, as you can see, these electrons are hits and by hitting these electrons these uh, other electrons that came from the cathode would have their energy stopped right they will stop there will be uh what they call it breaking radiation but technically they stop the 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 other electrons that in this atom will stop them and because they are stopped, we will have X-ray coming out of that atom. Some of them would hit an electron that is already in the atom, and that electron would also go flying by. Some of these will not hit an atom. It will just stop, and then they will create X-ray. And some of them will not stop completely, move on, but will still create X-ray. Okay? Hopefully it makes a little bit of sense. Again, just to trying to link what an atom look like, right? And how the atom uh, links to our X-ray production. So again, when a cathode is uh, hitting the anode atoms, these cathode electrons that are flying fast, they can either be stopped and because they are stopped, they would release the energy as an X-ray or they can hit another electron and also produce X-ray, uh, or can they, they can completely stop without hitting any electron and they can produce X-ray. That's how X-ray is produced.
Yeah. So the nucleus have some uh, gravity energy, right? That is what keeping all of the electrons running in these orbits without colliding with each other, without flying away, right? So when you hit something that is uh, fast as that electron that goes around and close to that nucleus, because of the energy of the nucleus, it will start to stop it. It will stop the 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 inner what is the word for it it will just stop the or slow down the electrons that is running by it right the more that it stop it the more energy will be released because it's all of that energy is gone it has to be released somewhere else and it'll be released as x-ray not all of these x-rays will be benefit for us you know beneficial for us as you will see only one percent of all of this happening you know all in, in the in the different atoms we will be actually using. Yeah. Okay. Any questions about X-ray production generally? I guess we get the idea and must probably, <laughs> when you go back and kind of sit and a uh, little bit focus, you can, you know, have it down. And definitely, if you have other questions afterwards, we'll definitely answer them. Okay. There's another uh, term or phenomena that is called uh, ionization. So if an atom loses an electron, right? We said these atoms have electrons and have protons, and usually any stable atom have equal amount of electrons and protons. So if we have six electrons here right we should have how many how many uh protons inside of the nucleus six as well right that makes a stable atom right if we lost or gain one more electron that will make an ion so it will not be a stable atom it will be an ion atom and that process is called ionization so adding an electron or removing an electron from an atom will make an ion, okay? If we add an electron, guess what the atom charge will be? Negative, right? Because we are adding one more electron, which is negative. If we're removing one electron from an atom, it will be what? Positive, right? Are we getting this? I know it's 2 o'clock or almost 3 o'clock, so... That's okay, but hopefully it will make sense. Okay. So, to fill in these blanks, in a stable atom, the number of electrons equals, right? When you have an atom that is stable, the number of electrons, which are the negative charge, and the protons, which are the positive charge, they will be equal, right? Blank are the atoms that have lost or gained electrons. Ions, yes, exactly. So ions, when an atom gain or lose electron, right? Ionizing radiation, that is the radiation that causes the, uh, the ions, that produce ions. Ionization, that is dislodging the electron. Again, this is the same thing. So uh, you will have a pair, again, because now this is, an atom and you have an electron running here right positive and we have this charge so now it's a stable atom you come in and you hit this electron and it's now gone up here and you have an atom that is positive right and you have an ion that and you have an ion or electron that is negative so this is the pair the ion pair you have an atom that is positive for example and electron that is negative so a positive ion which is the atom because it it's it doesn't have the electron anymore you know the electron is gone from it so it's now only positive and then you have the electron ion which is the negative one which we technically talked about anyway when you have an ionization you will have an ion pair one positive and one negative okay so the electromagnetic uh, spectrum. We kind of saw that anyway in the video in the first place. So this is the whole spectrum that will actually 
have the x-ray part in it. As you can see, there is visible light there. There is ultraviolet and there is the x-ray in here. So it is all part of the electromagnetic uh, spectrum that we have. So all of these are example of the electromagnetic uh, spectrum. Okay. And technically from the name, it has electronic and magnetic energy. But all of these, even see the radio, the TV, the microwave, the satellites, all of these are considered part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Okay. Now, as we said, it is a wave at the end of the day. So the electromagnetic spectrum is a wave and X-ray is part of that. X-ray is a wave, right? So we need to know a few terms about the uh, about that wave. So a few terms that we have are wavelength and frequency, okay? So the wavelength, if you see again, this is a wave here. And you have it going up and then down and then up and then down, right? So between two points, if you measure technically the distance between two points, that is your wavelength. So see the distance between two similar points, that is your wavelength. That's how we measure the wavelength. Only the shortest wavelengths with extremely high frequency these are the ones that we use them for dental radiographs, okay? Only the ones that have short wavelengths with high frequency, that's when we use them with that. So guess what is this definition? Blank is the number of waves produced per second. Yes, boom. Frequency is the number of waves produced per second, right? So the more waves you create per second, the higher the frequency, right? More waves per second mean there's a lot more frequency. Like if I tap once and that is a, a wavelength, right? Or, you know, each time I tap, it's a wavelength. So that is the frequency of the wavelength. You know, if I tap faster, that means it's higher frequency and more wavelengths. Okay. So I think this can go both ways, but let's pull that in. So the shorter the wavelength, the more short the wavelength is, the higher the frequency definitely, and then the more penetrating energy. And that's why this is what we use for dental radiographs. We only use the ones that have shorter wavelengths because they have more penetrating energy. Okay. And again, you have that in here. See, long wavelength, low frequency, low energy, less penetrating, shorter wavelength, high energy, high frequency, and more penetrating. Okay. So when we are creating these x-rays, about only, I did say that, only blank percent of energy actually would give us a usable x-ray. Only percent of our energy and the rest is 99%. Heat. So out of all that energy we put on the x-ray to make it run, only 1% of it is actually usable for us. And the rest of it is heat. That's why we enclose our tube head with insulating oil so that it would actually dissipate the heat that is produced, right? Again, if you go back to that picture that we saw here, all of this is insulating oil because we have a lot of heat created, right? Okay. As we said, X-ray, we cannot actually see it or feel it or any of that. 
So soft radiation would be long wavelengths. They do not have uh, penetration power. And we technically said that in the previous slide. And they're not suitable for dental radiographs. Hard radiation are short wavelengths. These are greater uh, penetration power and definitely used for dental radiographs. Okay, so um, there are technically two ways that the x-ray would form, which I explained already in a way, which is in the next slide, where I made a lot of uh, drawing here. <laughs> Let's see if I can delete that. Okay. As we said, electrons that come really quick, they would have energy. That energy will become X-ray. Again, just looking at the A, B, and C, which one of these actually hit an electron? C, okay. And it produces X-ray or not? Yes. Okay. How about A and B? Did it hit an electron? No. Did it produce X-ray? Okay, so that means we have two ways of creating X-ray. One way is by hitting an electron actually, right? And that will produce X-ray. And the other way is just by slowing down without hitting an, any electron and we'll still have X-ray done. Okay, so this is what this slide is about. It says that we have a general radiation and that is called breaking radiation. So it's not hitting any other electron, right? It's just breaking. They're, we're just stopping it. It's not fast anymore, but it's releasing energy that is becoming X-ray. See, when high-speed electrons are stopped or slowed down by the atom. So our X-ray is mostly this type. The X-ray that we get from the dental unit is mainly because these electrons were stopped or slowed down. It did not hit another electron, okay? The other X-ray or the other type of radiation is the characteristic radiation. And that is the one when the electron is colliding with another electron. And that is number C here. That is the characteristic radiation. While A and B is the general radiation, right? Relating to what we're talking about here. See, that's the general radiation, just the breaking radiation, which is A and B. We didn't hit any electron. Okay. Anyone can read this word? Rust, yeah, Bremsstrong. It's in German, and that means breaking radiation. I guess the it, that it was... Um, it was discovered by them first. So now let's take a look at this quick video that has uh, a good, nice explanation about the stopping radiation. No breaking. X-ray tubes produce X-ray photons by sending high-speed electrons from the cathode to the anode. As the electrons hit the anode, their kinetic energy is converted to X-ray energy. The most common type of electron anode interaction is the Bremsstrahlung interaction. Bremsstrahlung can also be referred to as Brems radiation and it is produced when projectile electrons are slowed down in the anode. Due to the electrostatic attraction between the electron and the nucleus, the electron is deviated from its straight line path. As it turns, it decelerates or slows down. This change in kinetic energy results in an X-ray photon being produced equal in energy to the amount of kinetic energy loss. This satisfies the law of conservation of energy. Yeah, that's the one that I was talking about. 
structural line interactions are responsible for producing a wide variety of X-ray photon energies. Because electrons may approach the nuclear field at different angles and speeds, different energy levels of photons will result. And an electron is not decelerated to as great a degree due to a less sharp turn, a lower energy photon is produced. Note the lower frequency and longer wavelength of this Rumsterlund photon. In the case of this electron, it has been deviated greatly from its original path, causing it to slow down even further. Because this electron has experienced the greatest change in its kinetic energy than the previous two electrons, it produces a photon with even greater energy than before, as seen by its increased frequency and decreased wavelength. 90% of the X-rays produced in the X-ray tube are due to Bremsstrahlung interactions. Okay, because so of most of our X-rays are from the breaking radiation. A variety of energies produced as a result of this process. Rems radiation is responsible for the heterogeneous nature of the X-ray beam. Boom. Oh, okay. Okay. Let's move on. See what else we have. So the properties of X-ray. I guess we all know that. Do, and definitely x-rays are the ones that can cause the ionization that we talked about you know to make ions x-rays can do that and ions are not good for our bodies and that what can actually develop to make you know cancer and diseases right and that's why we don't want to be near x-ray or we want to make our uh you know take our safe precaution with x-ray when we work so, things that will act with, so do you think that dense materials would absorb more or less x-ray? More, right? So bone is denser than the tissue, right? So you will see bone on an x-ray, but you will not see a tissue in your x-ray, right? You'll not see any uh, muscles in your x-rays you only see bone and you only see teeth so denser uh, materials would absorb more x-ray than thin uh, materials and when we are saying dense do we mean high atomic number or low atomic number high high atomic number dense mean high atomic number thin mean uh, low atomic number in this case so, when we hit bone or enamel, it will appear radio opaque, which means white or light gray in an x-ray. And the skin and the muscle and other things would appear radiolucent, which means black or dark gray in an x-ray. Again, because the bone and enamel is considered more dense, and that's why they would actually have uh, the x-ray stopped, not going through, and that's, why, that's how it will appear in the film. Uh, this is just to show you that's what we mean by the atomic number. I'm sure you have seen the periodic table of elements before. So this is the atomic number, and we know the atomic number means the number of Protons, exactly, inside of an atom. Okay. We have technically three types of radiation that will come up. I mean, um, how, I just want to differentiate between the things that we are saying now. This is the way of, of the production of the X-ray, right? General radiation and characteristic radiation, the way that it is generated. That is that is one category, uh, categorization that we talked about, right? Let's see, did we make any other categorization? I don't think so. So now the other categorization or types that we're talking about are the x-ray that come out, that come out of the tube, 
right? Now we're hitting the patient. What are we getting? We're getting a primary radiation, okay? And from the name, kind of, that is the one that we actually make use of. The primary radiation is the thing that will hit the teeth or hit the bone and then show us a good picture on the film inside a patient mouth. Any questions? No? Okay. So the primary radiation, that is the useful one, and that is coming from, you know, these type of radiations that we talked about earlier. The second type of radiation is the secondary radiation. The secondary radiation... So when we hit the primary radiation, right, and it hits a tooth, the tooth picture would appear on the film, right? But still, because the tooth is matter anyway, some of that radiation would create another radiation that comes around that would not only hit the film but goes around, right? Because anyway, it is an, an ionizing radiation, so it can make more radiation, and that is the secondary one. That is that we don't really want. So when Secondary radiation coming out, and it's not as penetrating, is not as useful. We don't make use of it. It actually makes our x-rays worse by reducing the contrast and having a low quality image. But it happens anyway. And I mean, we have some ways that we try to reduce the secondary radiation in a way, but it still happens. Okay. And the last type of radiation is called the scattered radiation, right? And this is when it's kind of similar to the secondary one, but it's actually in all directions. So it's just scattered from the name. The secondary one is just like you hit it and it goes to another direction. Just the same, you know, just making another one. While the scattered, you have more or multiple radiation going in all directions. Not really, no, no, not like it's almost with the x ray. As long as you're hitting x ray, you'll get a primary x ray and you'll get a secondary x ray and must probably get some scattered radiation. Yeah, there are ways that we, you know, reduce the like the uh, like even the PID, it, it helps with reducing some of these secondary ones and scattered ones that go around. So, like, we can work with it around it, but. Right. No, no. You get one. Yeah, in that beam that you're 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 sending. Once you click this, you have a primary beam that go out. Right. Okay. It will interact with the tooth, and then you'll get an image here. But since it interact with the tooth, you'll have some secondary radiation, and you'll have some scatter radiation as well. Most of the time, it will not affect because, again, the machines are better and uh, it's well sealed and all of that. But it's some, something that we need to know of. It's, you know, yeah, there are these things that come up, right? So it's not useful. It's more exposure to the patient and operator. Um, and again, definitely, I mean, if you put your x-ray in a wrong direction and all of that, you'll get more of these. But if you're following the right... Uh, safety measures, you should be safe, you know, it would not affect this. It's a minimal effect um, afterwards. Just uh, a picture of that. And I do have a video, I think I, you know, put on canvas, you can take a look at it. Other than these type of radiation, there is a background radiation that all around us, it can come from food, it can come from gases, from cosmic rays, from nuclear tests, and from other medical tests. So there's always some radiation around us, but it doesn't really hurt us because it's in a lower um, doses. There's no high doses of it. Like they always say, banana actually have some radiation in it, in a way, but you have to eat like, I don't know, 180 bananas every day for a year to really be have, you know, having any bad effects of the radiation, something like that. And then, 
I know we have to go up to finish these few slides, but this is the last slide of the second chapter. as Columbus. I don't know how, but <laughs> column per column, uh, but per kilogram. Okay. And that is the measure to measure the exposure in air. And you have gray and that is to measure the x-ray that is exposed or absorbed by the body tissues. And you have uh, severed, which is to measure the biological effects on the body. So we have three units to measure three different things. And you can see the small, the other names of them because we have two types of, of naming. You have the standard naming, which is the most recent one. And you have the traditional one, which is the obsolete one. Okay. But you need to know each one of them and what they measure. Okay. Each one of these units and what they would measure. I think we got through everything here. Let's just talk about these things. I mean, um, it's just an introduction. Um, and we heard about Rongting, the person that actually invented the x-ray. So that's why he called it an x-ray because he didn't know the exact nature of it. This is the picture uh, from him, from his wife, actually. That's how he tested it. He asked his wife. <laughs> to put her hand in, uh, and that's the first, I think that's the first x-ray technically taken. There are some other uh, not worthy scientists and researchers. You can see what they have done. I don't need to read this for you. And these are some improvements over the years, definitely the lead aprons with thyroid shields, which are these things. Um, they were really better protection for the patient. Uh, the lead lined walls, definitely for the operator, improved machines and film, automatic processors, uh, rectangular PID. Again, these things we're going to talk about them, panoramic radiographs and digital imaging, which is much, much uh, lower radiation than the regular imaging. Uh, we talked about safety, uh, safety uh, but, you know, these are some other points, definitely. Uh, that you can read through. Generally, you just have to make sure that you're following the correct rules um, and steps to take an x-ray. Definitely, you'll, you'll learn more about that in the lab where you know exactly how to do it. But that is mainly it for these chapters. Uh, do we have any questions? <laughs>